Wow, what an act to follow. Thank you, thank you, that was wonderful. Good afternoon. On behalf of the university, on behalf of the Division of Student Affairs, I'm honored to participate in our annual celebration for the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his vision of people of color and faiths coming together, a vision that is very important to us at our university. I'm also honored to introduce our guest speaker, uh, the Reverend Dr. Jeanette C. Wilson. Reverend Wilson is the co-founder of Wilson Howard PC Attorneys at Law, Inc., where she served as a criminal defense attorney for more than 15 years. She left the private practice of law for 13 years to serve as the full-time assistant general counsel for Reverend Jesse L. Jackson in Operation Push, Inc., and ultimately, was appointed to serve as Bush National Executive Director. Following her tenure at Bush, Reverend Wilson served as Interim General Counsel for Chicago State Univers University and as Special Counsel to Mayor Eugene Sawyer throughout his term in the office. Reverend Wilson currently serves as the Senior Advisor to Reverend Jesse L. Jackson's senior national president of Rainbow Bush, Inc., pastor of the Fernwood United Methodist Church in Chicago, and special assistant to the chief administrative officer of the Chicago Public Schools. She earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from McMurray College, a master's degree in environmental science from Governor State University, and a JD from the John Marshall Law School and a Doctor of Divinity degree from the United Theological Seminary. She has been an adjunct professor at a number of seminaries and universities, teaching courses in marketing, business law, church law, ethics, and church administration. Reverend Wilson has been honored by the Cook County Bar Association with the William R. Ming Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Civil Rights, She's also been named one of America's top 100 black business and professional women by Dollars and Cents Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Janet C. Wilson. Good afternoon. Uh, because I can't see you, you have to talk back to me, otherwise I won't know you're out there. Uh, the lights are, are really strange. I, I guess it's so that speakers won't uh, get nervous because you're just looking into a dark hole. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Conrad World for uh, arranging uh, this opportunity for me and for Megan Mitchell for facilitating such a powerful uh, program to salute the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and for uh, the vice, I mean the interim um, president for allowing me to come and hosting me. You have a very powerful interim president who served as the provost. He uh, is, has a commitment to diversity and in education and to building a, a high quality institution here and expanding uh, your reach beyond the walls of, of this uh, place. And then I want to thank my husband for coming, so if nobody else says amen, I know he, I know he will. <laughs> and the Mantu dancers uh, for really uh, connecting us to our African roots since all of us are people of Africa and people of African descent even when uh, many of us uh, don't acknowledge it. Uh, today is... Um, Celebrating this week, uh, this weekend, Dr. King's actual birthday was on Sunday, January 15th. And as I thought about uh, the 88th, what would have been the 88th birthday of Dr. King, uh, and I look at our, our country today, we really have to move from uh, disappointment and disillusionment to direct action. Uh, the challenge that many baby boomers like myself and, and persons in key positions in, in power face in America is the dilemma of implementing social change 
while we are working in Pharaoh's house. Uh, that is taking the role of the oppressed while we are citizens of a country that oppresses us. It is uh, difficult for those uh, of us who have spent time in the hallowed halls of these uh, institutions, many of whom funded the slave trade, many of whom uh, who continue to uh, foster the disconnect from uh, one race, one class, and one generation to another. And so uh, when I think about the growth and spread of many of the youth the movements around the country, Black Lives Matter, most recently, uh, before that, Occupy, they were occupying New York, occupying Chicago. The members of these movements are suggesting that many of the elders, many of the faith leaders are silent in the face of so many issues, uh, so many obstacles that stand in the way of uh, equity and parity in, in, in our community and in our country. Many of uh, the churches are viewed as, and even other religious institutions, but in particular the Christian church, viewed by many in your generation as irrelevant to both history and to the present. And so the challenges uh, we face today require, require all of us to, to rediscover some of the traditional values that uh, spawned leaders like Dr. King. Lutherans must look back to Bonhoeffer, who languished in prison for a cause. Baptists must remember the Anabaptists and the Methodists and reread Wesley and the abolitionists. The Catholics must go back to St. Francis of Assisi and begin to, to wrestle with the real challenges the church faces and not be, remain an entertainment venue uh, once a week or twice a week for those who are looking for a quick fix that won't last past the worship service. Baby boomers must look to the actions of Gandhi, Mandela, Dr. King, Malcolm X. And we must look, through, look at models and for witnesses that the church has made in the struggles for liberation, looking at liberation theology and the struggles as articulated by Dr. Howard Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited, or James Cone, and, or Dr. Jeremiah Wright, and even uh, in our present day, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and many, many others uh, that we can look at. Uh, Prathia Hall Wynn, who was a black female preacher who was arrested while demonstrating in the South, didn't go to get arrested, was arrested and taken to a, a, play, a prison far from the, uh, the town where she was sent as a part of the uh, Freedom Rider movement, where she was beaten within an inch of her life, or people like Fannie Lou Hamer. We must look to those models and remind uh, many of you in this generation that those models existed then and they exist now. And for the few mom moments that we have together, we should discuss the present crisis uh, that, African, that African Americans face within this American empire, we must see America as just that, an empire that has uh, continued to oppress, diminish uh, people of color, in particular African Americans and uh, Latinos, how they have failed to equitably, in this country, redistribute the wealth, how they have failed to share a political and economic power. And, and so uh, when you think about Dr. King, uh, one of the best ways to uh, really look at Dr. King is to examine some of his speeches, uh, review some of his sermons. And when you just look at the titles of his sermons, it would suggest to you the kind of things that he focused on in the 1950s and 60s. Rediscovering lost values, Paul's letter to American Christians, loving your enemies, a knock at midnight, 
the American Dream, Guidelines for a Constructive Church, Letter from the Birmingham Jail to the Religious Leaders, Black and White, Three Dimensions of a Complete Life, Why Jesus Called a Man a Fool, The Drum Major Instinct, Unfulfilled Dreams, Why We Can't Wait, talking about the Montgomery bus boycott and why it was important to uh, initiate this, that movement then. Where do we go from here, chaos or community? Uh, one of his last books, The Stride Toward Freedom. Uh, this following excerpt of um, one of Dr. King's speeches, uh, Remaining Awake During a Great Revolution, kind of frames the discussion that we need to have as we look at our present crisis. Davies went to hell because he sought to be a conscientious objector in the war against poverty. This can happen to America, the richest nation in the world, and nothing's wrong with that. This is America's opportunity to bridge the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. The question is whether America will do it. There is nothing new about poverty. What is new is that we now have the tools and the techniques to get rid of poverty. The real question is whether we will have the will. In a few weeks, some of us are coming to Washington to see if the will is still alive or if it's alive in this nation. We're coming to Washington in a poor people's campaign. Yes, we're going to bring the tired, the poor, and the huddled masses. Why do we do it this way? We do it this way because it's our experience that the nation doesn't move around questions of genuine equality for the poor, and for black people until it is confronted massively, dramatically, in terms of direct action. Great documents are here to tell us something should be done. We met here some years ago in the White House Conference on Civil Rights. We came out with the same recommendations that we are still demanding here, but nothing has been done. The President's Commission on Technology, Automation, and Economic Progress recommended these things some time ago. Nothing has been done. Even the urban coalitions of mayors of most of these cities of our country and the leading businessmen have said these things should be done. Nothing has been done. The Kerner Commission came out with its report just a few days ago and then made more specific recommendations. Nothing has been done. And I submit nothing will be done until the people of goodwill put their bodies and their souls into action, into motion. It will be a kind of soul force brought into being as a result of this confrontation that will make the difference. Yes, it will be a poor people's campaign. This is the question facing America. Ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. America has not met its obligations and its responsibilities to the poor. Now this speech, uh, and I've only read part of it, was delivered by Dr. King at the National Cathedral in Washington on March 31st, 1968, a few days uh, before his assassination. Dr. King suggests here and in many other messages that those in power do not bow or respond to meet the needs of those who are oppressed or those who live in the shadows of power unless and until those who've been dispossessed, disinherited, disadvantaged, unite and engage in massive, nonviolent, direct action for freedom and equality. You are, in, you are gathered in this place as students. Many of you are some of America's best and brightest. Some of you are the first generation of a family to make this costly step into the hallowed halls of academia. You are uncertain about your future and its potential for you personally and your generation collectively. You struggle with the pressures of surviving, awesome pressures of this uh, growing uh, capitalism. You're trying to assimilate into a culture of, of an academic world that is quite alien to your family's reality. Your daily struggles for economic viability, yet you're here at Northeastern. You have to ask yourself some questions. What should you say about the status of affirmative action versus the presence of inheritance in selecting, admitting, and awarding uh, students with scholarships. What should you say or do about the plight of the undocumented workers 
the 12 million undocumented that live and work and clean our bathrooms, work in our hotels, serve us uh, food in restaurants, wash our dishes. What should your position be on terrorism and militarism? What should you say about the economic injustices that are reflected in the massive student loan debt that most of you have? What should you expect from the companies that you support with your consumer dollars, the t-shirts you wear, the gym shoes you keep buying, the caps that you wear that market uh, companies that uh, discriminate against you, won't hire you, that you have no uh, financial investment in, and nor do they make investment in you? These questions, uh, oh, how should you address this movement around the nation for states' rights? where you have the majority of all of the southern states and the majority of many of the Midwestern states now moving to restrict and constrain the freedom to vote, the rights of uh, students to vote on campuses, the rights of students to receive uh, certain kinds of grants, like in Illinois, the MAP grant reduced or held up, like in many states uh, across the country, the Parent PLUS loans are cut or eliminated. Funding for higher education continues to decrease, and yet I don't see students alarmed or moving or acting about it. You go to schools where you never see yourself reflected in the leadership of, of the university at any level except in some marginal capacity where they cannot impact the courses that you must take and the requirements that you must meet to graduate. These questions and many other issues that you face today, we are living in one of the most powerful nations in the world. And uh, yet this country has more people behind prison bars than any other nation in the world. We still have the death penalty. We have people languishing in prisons in this country who make the seats that we sit on. They make the furniture for our government officials, whether they're in the United States Congress, the United States Senate, or even in our state houses. And yet when they return home, they cannot work in any furniture company. They have an X on them, which, which doesn't allow them the ease of voting. They don't have full citizenship in many states. They can't uh, work anywhere. They learn how to cut hair in jail, but they can't cut it when they get out. And so uh, they, they learn dog grooming in jail, but they can't groom dogs upon release, having served time. They learn a lot of skills and trades. Many of them are carpenters. They, they uh, make uh, rubber, tires. They make shoes in jail. They make reservations for hotels that they cannot stay in upon release. And so what is your generation going to do about it? What are you going to say about it? It's on your watch that... Young people are attending schools that do not educate them. Uh, most of the students that attend school in the Chicago area do not have sufficient understanding of basic uh, reading and math that would allow them to successfully go to the next grade level. Those students who are enrolled in elementary and high schools in those nine communities that uh, Commissioner Boykin called endangered. The poorest schools, they have the most, uh, most violence in the neighborhood. They have the least amount of resources in those schools. And when those children graduate from elementary or high school, there's no expectation. There's no reasonable push for them to, to move to institutions of higher learning or towards a career. There's no expectation that they will go anywhere but to jail or to uh, the morgue. This is, these are challenges that must cause you to have a revolution in your spirit. There must be something on the inside while you are sitting here reflecting on your next grade and your next subject and how you're going to make it next year or next semester. Somehow while you're here, there must be something that causes you to tremble, something that makes you wonder, what is your real purpose in life? What are you graduating? What are you coming here to do? What are you going to do when you leave here? How are you going to impact the world that you will live in? Now, 
uh, we are facing a transition in power. Some would argue that uh, the former president that is, well, the existing president who's leaving the office did very little for African Americans. And so uh, many are, are wondering what difference will it make? Well, I, I would submit to you that it's gonna make a great difference. Because while you may not focus on the personality, you must understand the power of the position. You must look at the power of the office. The president nominates an entire cabinet that impacts everything that you and I do every day. The president appoints a secretary of education. And while many people are listening to the secretary of education talk about her view about privatizing public education, which will diminish the number of young people who will be prepared for college at all, or that will ever be able to be educated. That's one side. But she also will be over, if, if she is approved, she will also manage what happens in higher education. She will look at the allocation of resources for institutions like this one and other institutions across the state and around the nation. And so you have the opportunity and the challenge to focus on reacting to the possibility of oppression. You must be prepared and strategically focused on what are we gonna do to make sure that our lives and the lives of the people that we represent and those we can impact will not be worse off because of this person who goes into office for the next four years. This person will nominate a secretary of transportation, which will impact the allocation of resources to cities like Chicago. If you think the CTA is not working well for you now, I want you to try it in a few months. This person will select and nominate secretary of agriculture, which will impact our farmers, many of them black farmers who are struggling as it is and Native American farmers and Latino farmers. It will impact the agricultural community for generations yet to come. Are you concerned about whether you're eating organic or inorganic? Well, you better think about who controls the resources that go to family farmers, small farmers in America? Who will make those decisions? And so you sitting here studying, what are you studying for? What are you thinking about? When you sit here, what are you writing about? School is a place, for, it is a laboratory for you to study, reflect, and act. This is the best of times for you. You have the power if you would just move. You can't be comfortable having social clubs and what party you're going to hang out with and who you're going to hook up with. The hookup won't matter in a few moments. This person will nominate somebody to sit on the Supreme Court to a Senate that is clearly against the interests of people of color and for the rights of those who are marginal. This president will nominate someone to sit on that court and we clearly don't have a friend in the one African American looking person that's sitting there. So you got to be very focused. I didn't call his name. <laughs> Yeah, just I'm not going to name him because y'all taping me with your cell phones. <laughs> not that I care. Uh, and so you got to remember, I just want y'all to go back and think about, and read about some of the disillusionment our, our ancestors, your ancestors must have felt in Montgomery when they had to get on a, in a disappointment, when you had to get on a bus trying to go to work, you're already tired or leaving work, you're worn out, you've worked all day, and you had to sit in the back if there was a seat in the back. If you sat in the front, if a white person got on the bus, you had to surrender your seat. It didn't matter how, what, how old you were. It did not matter how tired you were. It didn't even matter that you were on there first. You had to get up. And so when you think of that Montgomery bus boycott and you could see those women, those day workers and those men who had to go work in fields, walk to work and walk back home or maybe the few that had a car, not many did, to give up their comfort that we might ride a bus and then we still trying to sit in the back? I can't figure that out. 
I'm not comfortable sitting in the back anymore. I always sit in the front because I can now. I knew when we couldn't. And so I don't take it for granted. I remember what Rosa Parks, she wasn't just somebody that was tired. She sat down so that, w- that we might stand up, that we might be able to own bus companies. We didn't own those companies then. And that bus company in Montgomery was owned by people in Chicago. So the racism was connected from Montgomery to Chicago. And that is why there has to be a continuous, unbroken line of understanding about the struggles we face. Well, maybe you don't care about Montgomery bus boycott. Maybe you're thinking about the March on Washington and and Dr. King's speech. He wasn't the primary speaker that day. He wasn't even the featured speaker that day. He was just one of many. I mean, a whole lot of people spoke that day. He was the one who decided to challenge the American government. He started, it wasn't about a dream, it was about a bad check. How many of you had a bounce check? Don't raise your hand, don't want your neighbors to know you. I mean, if you had a a bad check, a bounce check, you know how you feel when your check bounced. Well, I've had it. And, you know, you try to act, especially if it's public when, you know, the the check, like if you wrote a bad check and somebody you know and you're real embarrassed when they give it back to you, like at church or someplace, one of your friends, you wrote the check to buy something, they bought the thing and the check bounced and you try and explain, well, you know, the bank made a mistake. And I don't know what they did, but... uh, uh, We're going to work it out. You don't have any money. You don't have any cash in your pocket to cover that bad check. And you really may be genuinely concerned, but I guarantee you America is not. Nobody cares if you get educated. That's, it's, it's not designed to accommodate us. The reason you can come here is because somebody fought for it. The reason you can sit in this building is because somebody decided to fight to open up the process in higher education. And so when Dr. King came to Chicago and, and, and uh, black people were living in what was considered to be slum conditions, they had adjusted to the conditions. They woke up with rats and roaches running and water full of lead, not even dealing with, let's not, deal, let's not stay here any longer. We can't live like this. This is inhumane. They had adjusted to those conditions until he moved in to the slum. So why would he do that? Because in order to change something, you must be proximate to the problem. You must feel the pain of those that you say you're going to change it for. Dr. King didn't have to live like that. He was born into a family of privilege. He was a Baptist preacher's son, a Baptist preacher's grandson in the South, in Atlanta. He was a great big somebody. And he reduced himself that he might be able to fight for those who who couldn't fight for themselves. When he went to uh, Memphis, it wasn't just to give a speech on on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. He was there because those garbage workers were being killed and abused. They had no rights. They were working without benefits. They had no health insurance. They would kill you on the truck, uh, close you up in there. It didn't matter to the people. They never got to drive the truck. They were always the ones who were inside, had to ride inside with the garbage. He went to Memphis for the garbage workers. So... The poor people's campaign, it wasn't just about poor people that were black. He he realized that poor people were poor in Appalachia. Have you ever been to Appalachia in Ohio where you see white poverty at at its peak? When you go down through Appalachia and some parts of the South and some parts of even Illinois where people are still today with dirt floors, without uh, indoor plumbing, people living in this century struggling on reservations, the indigenous people who were here first when, this, when Columbus didn't discover anything, didn't even make it to this, the, the shores of America. He's somewhere lost talking about he discovered America. America was not lost. The country was here. There were a group of people here living quite well from the land teach, and had to teach the pilgrims how to eat. So when you think about the struggles don't diminish the past. 
And don't diminish your elders because they're not marching so much right now. They don't have any more energy. They've given themselves to their season. It's your season. And you don't have the right to simply criticize the past. The, the thing you must do is challenge yourself. You must be the drum majors that you're looking for. Yeah, black lives matter. All lives matter. Yellow lives matter. Red lives matter. All lives matter. Poor people matter. And if you think they matter, then you have to march, not just to be on the street and challenging the force that can incarcerate and can kill you at will, uh, particularly with this transition. You all don't remember when uh, Mayor Daley said shoot to kill. The senior. He flew over us in helicopters when there were demonstrations in Chicago, and they called them riots, and, and Dr. World knows more uh, about the, that particular one. I was coming home from school and heard the announcement, shoot to kill. This came from the sitting mayor who cared less about the demonstration, what he was focused on is get rid of them, whatever it takes. And so when, when uh, people like Bobby Rush and Congressman Rush and Congressman Davis and Reverend Jackson and Conrad Whirl are seen on the street and they're challenged by people who've done nothing but be born. So you have to... Uh, <laughs> You have to remember, that this, is, this is really something that I know I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Dr. King said this, and this is part of his Chicago campaign, because you have to know the history to really know what you should be doing. You cannot keep, uh, marching was a strategy. It was not just an activity. We didn't march to get on the news. We marched to put pressure I mean, uh, when uh, Reverend Willie Barrow shut down the, um, the Dan Ryan with a group of us, we shut the Dan Ryan Expressway down, not because we just wanted to stop traffic. Black, we found out that black uh, road contractors didn't get to build a road. And we said, we drive on the Dan Ryan every day. Most people you see going on the Dan Ryan are black. So we felt they were going to do something work on the Dan Ryan, we felt that we should be able to do the road work. And we had tried to talk to the then governor, and you know he, he didn't listen to us, and so we tried talking to our little legislators, and we could not get the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate at that time to respond because we wanted to have our share of the construction contract. So we decided one day to just shut the Dan Ryan down. And we did and had the media and we had trucks to slow the traffic down because you had to make it safe. So we slowed the traffic down to a standstill and stood out there with a wheelbarrow indicating that you know we wanted to um, get our share of road construction in Illinois. And as a result of the demonstration, the governor then decided it would be helpful if he met with us. And so that's how we met with him and we got our share of road con construction contracts. But the purpose was for a particular aim. We had an end. We were just not marching. They didn't march from Selma to Montgomery just to cross the bridge. They were marching for voting rights. There's a public policy. There's an economic agenda if you go back through the uh, history. And so Dr. King came to Chicago, the Chicago campaign in 1966. He said, I must appeal to the decency of the people of Chicago of the Chicago Real Estate Board. You are negotiating this question with us. You are a men confronted with a moral issue. I decide on the basis of conscience. A genuine leader doesn't reflect consensus. He molds consensus. Look at myself. There are lots of Negroes these days who, who are for violence, but I know that I'm dealing with a moral issue, so I'm going to oppose violence. If I'm the last Negro in this country speaking for nonviolence, I'm going to be the last one. Now, the real estate people must act on principle in the same manner, or they're not leaders. The real estate industry has not only reflected discriminatory, discriminatory attitudes, it has played a significant part in creating them. 
This has been a constructive and creative beginning. You know, Dr. King was always very diplomatic. This represents progress and a sign of change. I've gone through this whole problem in my mind a thousand times about demonstrations. And let me say, if you're tired of demonstrations, I'm tired of demonstrating. I'm tired of the threat of death. I want to live. I don't want to be a martyr. There are moments when I doubt if I'm going to make it through. I'm tired of getting hit, tired of being beaten, tired of going to jail. But the important thing is not how tired I am. The important thing is to get rid of the conditions that lead us to march. And so today, when you think about two million Americans, mostly African-American males, are incarcerated behind prison bars. When you think about 20 million Americans whose health care insurance is in jeopardy with this new administration. Uh, when you think about the several trillion dollar crushing student loan debt that your generation faces. When you think about Native Americans at Standing Rock fighting for homeland fighting for just a piece of a, a country that they were here in the beginning, fighting for a piece of a place where their ancestors can remain and rest in peace. When you think about the urban cities like Flint, Michigan, where water is in the pipes and people are acting like the lead, the lead in the pipes has nothing to do with the brain damage and the health issues that the children and the adults now face. And nobody seems to understand that you have to now retrofit and invest in that city. And somebody should go to jail. When you think about what is happening in Chicago, this violence is not about bad people. It is about poverty. It is about the misallocation of resources to targeted communities. Anytime your health care is determined by your zip code, your access to health care is determined by your zip code, your access to high quality education is determined by your zip code and by your, your income level. So if you look at schools in Nequa Valley, or even if you look at schools on the near north side, there's a different quality of education in the same school district based on race and based on class alone. When you think about the conditions under which you live, you can't sit by. You have a moral obligation. You have a challenge, a charge to keep. You have a movement to lead. You have public policy to shape and to change. You have to have the will to stand. And even when it means challenging your comfort zone, you have to move past your comfortable, I, I, I just got to sit here and be quiet because I got to get my grade. No, you better stand now because later you won't be able to stand. You better stand while you still have blood war running in your veins, while you have the energy to fight. You have the intellect with which to stand. You better stand because if you don't stand, Everybody will fall around you, and sooner or later, you'll be falling too. Can we give Reverend Wilson another huge round of applause? But I think the dancers uh, were helpful in reminding all of us of our African roots, and not limited to African Americans, but it, it kind of created an atmosphere to suggest that there's, there was some significant meaning around the drums that were beating in Africa and the drums that the slaves uh, used to communicate when they were brought here. They could not communicate since they were uh, from different tribes and different countries even, but they could communicate through the, the drums and the dances, and, and that was their way of expressing themselves, expressing their discontent, but also organizing themselves to challenge the structures of oppression.